Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about um, you know globalization and what happens when you economically get freer as a country. So let's remember something. Globalization is the increased interconnectedness of people and countries, both economically and culturally. Obviously, globalization spreads goods, services, ideas, and resources around the world. Let's understand that those worldwide markets exist in a lot of different faucets. Not just the good services and factors of production, but it's the understanding that governments are actually going to have to deal with the fact that goods, services, factors of production, and ideas start coming around the world. And political borders become more porous and, and actually pretty transparent because ideas don't need a political border. Government actually, whenever um, globalization occurs and markets become freer, actually has less control over the economy because you have all of these different ideas, attitudes, um, cultural norms that kind of permeate over the economy and then into the country. And that can have a lot of impacts on the government's ability to get its own policies going. And with that, in those ideas spreads different types of uh, technology, information. So if you're a dictatorship, if you're Russia, if you're China, if you're Iran, um, and you know you start getting information about um, things like democratic ideals and civil society and all these um, more liberalizing um, measures and ideas, that can really start to put pressure on your regime to make things happen. So we take this, which we, you know, the, a typical free market, and if we actually expand this globally and worldwide, this is what globalization looks like. You know, you have a households no longer are just, you know, something within your country, your community, uh, your region. Now it becomes worldwide. So households in Mexico City can go work for Google, and not only just by immigrating to the United States, you can now do it remotely. So much stuff is just done over a computer screen. You don't need to necessarily be in the house. And this changes the dynamics of, from both Mexico and the United States point of view. If you're a Nigerian worker, you're a doctor, you're a software engineer, you don't need to go all the way to China to work for a Lenovo. You could do it from your house if you have you know, adequate internet. And so this you know, changes the factors of Nigeria needing to modify its technology and, and get more uh, into the information age, and, and China becomes more diverse in terms of their ideas that are brought by the work ethic and the culture that is from Nigeria. So this creates all kinds of interesting and complex situations when you start opening up your markets globally. So let's talk about this idea of economic liberalization. And no, liberal does not mean, hey, snowflake, progressive, but they get, get, that's a political attitude. It's really just the United States. No, liberal means free. In its classical sense, liberal means free. Therefore, economic liberalization is economies, economic systems becoming more free. So economic liberalization is when countries create policies that reduce government action and economic system moving towards a more free market-based uh, system. Understand, we're not talking about taking an economy and making it pure capitalist laissez-faire. We're talking about you're making it freer. You're allowing markets to open, you're allowing trade to happen, that kind of thing, all right? It's less government controls, taking governments away from here and moving them farther down this direction. Why would you do that? Well, basically because governments that work in here, you know, countries that work in here are better off than countries that work over here at the margin. Now, now where here is, is, the, is different. Like that, kind of like uh, the margins can change whether you're more neoliberal like the United States or more welfare capitalist like the UK. But the freer from this side way over here to the other side, um, the freer it becomes, the more well off the citizens of a country actually are. Not laissez faire, but definitely a mixed system. Okay. Now, there are international economic organizations around the world that try to use incentives to try to help out um, countries to become more economically free. One is the International Monetary Fund, otherwise known as the IMF. This uh, is a cooperative effort by countries within the United Nations to basically loan money to countries if you become more economically liberal. All the AP6 countries are part of the IMF, and a lot of the what you will see as Global South countries, um, Iran, Nigeria, uh, they uh, 
take in quite a bit of money from the IMF to become more economically liberal countries. Um, the World Bank, this is a, uh, a, a group of economic organizations of, of large, uh, both governments and the banking system to provide money and technology to developing countries to reduce poverty. Usually this is through loans and grants. Again, if you become more economically liberal in your policies, um, we're going to um, really work with you in trying to create um, economic wealth and economic growth. This is an international governmental organization, so it's, um, it includes elements of government in uh, making these work. All the AP6 countries are part of the World Bank, and again, places like Mexico, Nigeria, and Iran have taken in more money from the World Bank. Um, Mexico, of course, it's a developing country. It's taken less over time. And then the World Trade Organization. This is the, uh, a, an organization, an international government organization of countries that develops rules of trade. And all the countries except for Iran are part of the uh, World Trade Organization to try to create free trade around the world. And these countries settle a lot of world trade debates within this organization to try not to get into things like trade wars and getting tariffs and all that kind of thing. All right. So then why do it? Why do you want to be a part of an economic organization? Why do you want to take part in it? Uh, number one is that you want to increase global trade. You want to create a, a, a greater global respect for trading partners. Remember, when people trade, especially ideas, that actually creates a, a, an amount of appreciation for another country, and you're less likely to be in conflict with it. It accesses other markets and other goods and services. When you think about it, the United States gets a whole lot of stuff from around the world. And uh, around the world gets a lot of stuff from the United States. That's, that's good. It means there's stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise. It helps grow your GDP. Trade overall helps grow GDP and um, GDP per capita. Usually um, countries that engage in free trade get wealthier over time. This is the very clear trend. Now. Trade includes um, corporations, and multinational corporations are corporations that have facilities in at least one other country than its home country. All the big companies, you know, Starbucks, Google, Nike, Coke, Pepsi, Amazon, they all have, you know, uh, facilities in at least one other country around the world other than the United States. And they, they work and market differently in those different countries. Now, being a multinational corporation creates um, costs in those countries too. There's often issues around labor and pay. A lot of people do not like the fact that in poor countries, uh, laborers make less, sometimes significantly less than somebody in the United States would make. And labor conditions can also be problematic. And this can create protests at, um, at, at, a, at a, a more populous stance if they are not taken care of. There is environmental damage in a lot of different countries due to um, multinational corporations going in with lesser environmental regulations and really opening up those factories and getting them going. And then that host country ends up suffering instead of the home country like the United States. We have land rights, whether it's indigenous or farmers or just like regular old people, a place like China that, that tossed off a lot of landowners to build cities. Um, you know, the idea of who owns land is not the same everywhere. And so um, host countries uh, and the multinational corporation are often kind of getting engaged in a tussle over that. Taxation, uh, you know, what do you do about, um, you know, corporations that work with it? Usually the reason, part of the reason why multinational corporations go to these countries because the tax rates are low. And what will happen often is that people will get a little frustrated and be like, well, you're here taking advantage of our cheap labor and everything else. What are you doing to actually help the tax base and the infrastructure of our country? Um, some examples of some social impacts that you might see on an AP test, and you can use as examples. Uh, Shell Oil Company is big in the Niger uh, Delta in Nigeria, and this has created um, a lot of non-governmental groups as a part of civil society going out there, a lot of protesting. In some cases, there's actually political violence around the um, oil destruction within the Niger Delta that we'll be looking at. Uh, 1994, uh, in the state of Chiapas, after the North American Free Trade Agreement was passed, there was a near revolution that happened out of Chiapas that created regional instability in southern Mexico. Um, anytime in Iran, R uh, Russia, and Nigeria, you get any kind of negative press regarding corporations and governance, then you get um, 
arrest of protesters and the media is really censored. And of course, whenever you have different ideas, different people's immigration going into countries, you get nationalists to start to rise up and say, um, this is the, you know, we don't want them ruining our country, whether it's them in terms of ideas, goods and services, um, movies, music, or immigrants. Um, you'll see this with the rise of uh, Andres uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico. He's pretty nationalistic. Of course, Putin and Xi in Russia and China, respectively, extremely nationalistic. Companies will move to countries and invest. And this is um, when a country invests a business in, a, in another country, um, that business is known as part of foreign direct investment. And you can see the impacts of foreign direct investment within countries like Mexico. So in uh, between 1994 and 2000, they start to heavily invest in northern Mexico. And does that have a positive result? Well, yeah, a lot of businesses open along the border of the United States in northern Mexico. But you also see a lot of people migrate from southern Mexico, which is poor, to no northern Mexico for um, because this is where the prosperity is in northern Mexico. And GDP per capita in northern Mexican states is significantly higher than GDP per capita in southern Mexican states. And it's because these foreign multinational companies invested in northern Mexico and not southern Mexico because of its proximity with the United States. And so what has this created? Well, NAFTA, when it was passed in 1994, it's made a north that is wealthier, more better supported for infrastructure, and uh, more jobs, and eventually uh, a... Pawn, a political party that was created to support business. South, much poorer, fewer jobs, less infrastructure, and they support a populist party known as Morena. And so, you know, technology, globalization really has an impact. Freer markets, economic liberalization has a real impact on countries and their sovereignty.